Congratulations, you made it to the fourth and final free interview. Hopefully you've picked up some useful information that you can start using today to make your farming or ranching operation more successful. Today's guest has combined holistic management, key line design, permaculture, and many other philosophies to make his own style of management that he calls Regrarian. Darren Doherty has designed over 1,000 properties across four continents, and today he joins me to talk about the ecologically friendly agricultural revolution taking place across the world. Now, keep an eye on your email inbox because after this interview, I have some more free resources headed your way. Thanks again for listening. Let's get started. All right, welcome to another episode of the Agricultural Insights Podcast. As always, I am your host, Chris Stelzer. Joining us all the way from Australia today is Darren Doherty. Welcome to the show, Darren. Thanks, Chris. Uh, pleasure to be on, mate. Yeah, thanks for thanks for taking the time to do this. Um, Darren, before we get started talking about you know regenerative agriculture, permaculture, sustainable farming, as it's all known by. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself to give us a little bit of context for the conversation we're about to have? Um, well, I'm 46 today, and I'm um, I'm from a farm in central Victoria that our family had, had for um, nearly 150 years. Um, we lost that farm in the in the two, early 2000s. It went out of the family, which was a very sad moment, and. Uh, one of those things that defines one. Um, we, my wife and I, uh, Lisa Heenan and I, have uh, three children, um, and who are all interested in and working in our business, which is great. We uh, we have a small farm outside of the town that we come from, and we have a global uh, regenerative agriculture consultancy farm planning consultancy, and uh, we also have a, a non-profit, Regrarians Limited, which uh, um, works to um, deliver educational outcomes around an outreach, around sort of regenerative agriculture and living. That's what pretty well sums up what we're up to. When I was researching you and what you're up to to do this interview, I had a hard time, I'm not going to lie, uh, and that's because... You know, you don't really fit, fit into a box. You know, you're not necessarily a farmer. You're not necessarily a rancher. You don't just do permaculture only. You you kind of do all of those things and, and bring them together as one. So how did you end up, you know, taking bits and pieces of all these different philosophies and ways of doing things and, and bringing them together to do what you do? It's funny, the uh, screensaver on my computer just happens to say erratic. I don't know if that's a Freudian or not, but um, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, look, um, I grew up with my, uh, my father was killed in the Vietnam War when I was four months old, and so, um, which was another defining thing in my life, and uh, so I grew up on my maternal grandparents' farm, and my maternal grandfather was, became my father, more or less, and uh, until my mother remarried. And he used to sit with me all the time, and well, and I worked with him. I was like his ninth child, and um, and so he had his own sort of revision, revisionism in child in his child raising with me. I think, um, but he used to take me under his wing a lot, and we'd go around the farm, and um, he'd tell me things all the time, like uh, he'd, he'd say, you know, the rural skills that I teach you now will um, will hold you in good stead when the when the proverbial hits the fan and um, cause he grew up through the depression and um, you know, he, he was someone who um, was a classic Aussie farmer. And I know that farmers are like this all over us, all over the world. Um, he was a make do sort of person. Um, he was never bored. There was always a million and one things to do each day um, that you followed through and that they were, um, they were quite didactic. You know, you were, doing everything from managing managing the books to making soap to milking to killing and processing animals to all of those things. So, I mean, you, you come from an environment like that as a child, uh, which I really lapped up, and um, it's, it's probably no coincidence that uh, I work the way I do, where I have a – I'm very fortunate that I have a very diverse um, – a program of work in front of me um, 
And added to that, you know, the, the influence of things like permaculture early in my career, um, where I was influenced that, you know, here's a methodology that um, promotes diversity. And to me, the promotion of that diversity is not just in um, the environments that you're working with or the agroecologists that you're working with, but it's also in the um, in the way you structure your business and structure your life. And that really hit a chord naturally with what we wanted to do. So early in our business, you know, um, our application of diversity was, well, I'd design a property, but then I'd also work on that property and develop that property. And so that our business had multiple income streams to support it during its early foundational years. And, and that's fairly fairly well carried on. And we we came to a point where fairly early on in all of this, that we saw that um, if we were going to apply our work mainly to uh, rural um, and regional agricultural scale landscapes, that we needed to have diversity in our business and our approach, um, that there wasn't one just one church to follow. So we're very much, a, if you like, a polytheistic um, um, sort of... Uh, we have a, you know, we have it. We have it. We have a, a, um, a program which will will draw from a, a whole range of different methodologies, and so whatever's appropriate for a particular client and a particular landscape will then will draw from it. Uh, so, as uh, Alan Savory and Kirk Gadzia say, you know, you're playing with a full cart, a full deck of cards, um, as opposed to confining yourself because that's not the way it works. I think it's really important to. Um, you know, have the freedom to use whatever is best and yeah. go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, there's there's few people that I think have been doing it like you've been doing it, um, but it is kind of catching on, you know. Um, mm. Everyone's realizing that it, that diversity factor is very huge. Um, and I want to talk about kind of the 10 rules that you've laid out uh, that you like to talk about? I don't know if you call them the 10 rules. What do you refer to them as? <laughs> well, I, I started off calling them, the, when I f first started using them, I started calling them the Regen 10. And then um, when I developed the word um, regrarian, I, I, you, I, it basically became the foundation of that. So I call it the regrarian platform because that's basically the platform of of how we operate our whole regrarian thing. Um, and so... Um, and I should note that the first eight of those and the real genesis of that um, came from P.A. Yeomans and his key line scale of permanence, which he developed in the mid-50s and was first expressed in his book, The Challenge of Landscape in 1958. Okay. So, yeah, so, um, you know, I, st I grew up on a key line designed farm and um, I certainly stand on his shoulders with a lot of the work that I do. Yeah, that's... That's fantastic. Um, we'll get into more of the key line stuff later, but the, the first of the Regrarian 10, I guess you could say, is the, the human climate or the climate. And yep. this is the most difficult thing to change. Um, so there's a lot of systems you use to attempt to work within that climate, right? But yeah, um, it's not necessarily something you're going to go out and change immediately. Oh, heck no. Um, it's... The reason why I put, uh, you know, Yeomans had climate at the start, but he was talking more about the biospheric, the biospheric climate, mm -hmm. and um, and for me, I mean, obviously that's a contentious issue, and it's right up there as well, um, but very very difficult to change, um, in spite of our best efforts. Um, but the the human climate is one that uh, you know anybody who works in agriculture knows that uh, you know farmers, ranchers, etc., are fairly strong-minded mob and uh you know it's you don't go into environments like that um and and just expect people to follow you um there's certainly things that make people change um, the market is one thing that uh, that we found to be a motivation to change people's behaviors but uh, there's other things too and just, uh, you know, we found that the tools of, um, of Alan Savory's holistic management framework have been um, more than effective, and we've really enjoyed the time that we've had to involve ourselves in holistic management thinking and uh, those frameworks. 
but then there's others too. We sort of bring in all of the, um, the there's quite a number of ecological design principles that are out there, um, and uh, even uh, Odom's uh, fundamentals of ecology and whatnot that that we want to put forward so people really understand this climate subject as being what we call the rules of the game because they really are the rules of the game. I mean, you come into a biospheric climate which you it, which your property just has to basically accept as a rule of the game and then uh, you come to the project with your enterprise um, expectations and plans and they create other rules for the game and um, and uh, then you've got to work on yourself and how you can you can best manifest all of uh, your aspirations and uh, and that that can be pretty tough and uh, some people can have a fair bit of inflexibility there so we use those tools as best we can to um, and those um, parameters as best we can so that people can act accordingly. Yeah. So it seems like when you go and do courses somewhere or when people hear about your ideas, may, maybe one of the main motivating factors for them is the fact that they can earn more money. Yeah, definitely. Um, I and mean, I think that's quite reasonable because... I don't think there's ever been a time in history where people who are working in agriculture have had such appalling terms of trade so, and are really at the bottom of the, uh, the very, veritable industrial food chain. Um, it's, it's a disgrace the way um, people are treated in such an indignant way when they're the most important people on the planet, in my opinion. So um, when you meet that sort of... Um, when you meet that sort of person, I mean, you know, today the pe- the people who are in who have survived all of the various contractions in agriculture, uh, especially in the post-war period, um, I mean, they're they're real survivors. To you know, regardless of any criticisms people have about their production systems, um, the fact that they're still there managing these landscapes, I think, hats off to them. So they're they're naturally very strong people with very strong minds and um, it's not just luck that's got them there in, in many cases. So um, so you're dealing with strong people and um, so you need to you need to use the tools that are available to, to work with them. And uh, this is a suite that we found. And, you know, it's the same with our consultancies. We do more consulting work than we do training work and um, so I'm sitting at the kitchen table often for the first time um, that I've met people, and we're heading straight to the the real hard issues. So it's a it's a challenging first hour of our conversation, but it's fun at the same time, and I yeah you know, I enjoy the process. Yeah, how does that conversation go? Because I mean, there's people that have contacted me that you know their family members are older and they're running the farm, and they want to get into the farm ranch, but they you know have different ideals about how the farmer ranch should be managed. So I'm sure you being a third party helps dramatically, right? Um, Because there's not necessarily an emotional attachment there. But how does that conversation go and and how do you kind of guide them uh, toward a a more sustainable way of doing things, I guess, if you want to use that term? Yeah, I don't usually, but um, I will in this case. (laughs) Um, Look, um, the first thing that we try and work on it. Look, I'll take it back a little. I worked in hospitality um, after I left the farm for a few years and um, one of the things that I learned there was, um, you know, I'd have to sell, if I was waitering, um, I'd have to sell um, X amount of dollars worth of uh, food a night to the clients that I have and we were taught a thing called control dimensions when we did our training then. And the control dimensions are basically that you will come to a table and you'll assess in, you know, in rapid time um, the personalities of the people that you're working with, and so that you could get that you could get that sale basically. Now, I usually drive to someone's farm. Someone's already sent me some information about their property and what they're doing um, in the, you know, and all of that. Sometimes we go have an online session where we discuss things a bit earlier, so we break a bit of ice there. Um, but you know, when I even when I drive up the driveway, I can make a ton of assessments about uh, the style of person that they are, um, and the dis- based on the on the landscape decisions that they've made, and that really gives me a quite a good found, uh, foundation for when we start the conversation. 
the conversation i'm i um really like the style of uh, the late bruce ward where um he immediately would ask people you know why do you do what you do um and i really enjoyed bruce's approach and he was a great consultant and a great person and you know so I draw I, I, in that situation when I'm I've come to the kitchen table. Um, I draw on the work of um, Bruce Bruce Ward, an old friend, who um, the late Bruce Ward, and uh, what he would do would always ask people, "Why do you do what you do?" And now people would either say that that was something that would um, that they don't really want to talk about, and they just want to talk about more production based issues, and that's their context, so we have to respect that. But other, for other people, that's a that's the start of a broader conversation around um, a whole. I mean, it can open a really big box. Um, whether it's a whole succession discussion because people are very motivated to to keep the farm in their fat family, um, it might be that they have a deep passion for the for the for their work as a land steward, which a lot of people do. Um, it could be a combination of a whole lot of things. I mean. People on the land are often very deep thinkers and uh, are often doing that, you know, quite introspective. And uh, so I, in some ways, give them an opportunity and a licence um, in an environment that they're comfortable in, they're, like their kitchen table, um, to do just that. And uh, I really enjoy and uh, really enjoy that, being part of that and uh, being brought into people's lives in that way and to try and facilitate that as well and to facilitate the conversations um, between family members that may otherwise not ha- happen and um, and that really builds on that like I say the climate of the project so I really enjoy bringing women into conversations where maybe they haven't been as much um, and and that's that's something I, I really try and focus on if I can if they're not a key decision maker, outwardly will in um, I think they should be and you know so we, we do our best to try and um, read the situation and then um, direct it in that particular way it's a really enjoyable and uh, humbling experience okay um, so the next uh, thing on the list is um, geography and it seems mm-hmm. in this list basically from my understanding goes from a really broad picture and you're continually focusing a little bit more on getting closer um, to the earth um, and to people in a way. Um, mm-hmm. So the next issue is geography. And you said something in a video I watched during my research that you you design systems for how they'll be in the future, not necessarily mm-hmm. for how you want them to be now. So first of all, did I get that right? And what do you mean by that? Could I just could I just before I get to that point, um, I just wanted to close the climate thing in that conversation there. Oh, sure, yeah, 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 yeah that's fine. Um, one of the things that um, I also wanted to just put forward there that it's really important. Um, this is the holistic management stuff where we're building that context. Is yes, that one one will look on the quality of life outcomes, but two is we want to really really refine how we're going to monetize that uh, that uh, quality of life through a description around the enterprises and start to bounce off all of those ideas about what are the potentials and try and try and knock stuff off from being what's you know what's dreaming and what's uh, what can be reality and then we're also looking at um, what the future resource base will be you know what do people that want to leave as a residue of their work in the in the short medium and long term and then and and also in that, I look at um, you know what sort of succession do you want to have? How, how are we going to work with those sorts of programs and so on? So that really goes through that. Now, when we get to geography, um, in respect to your question, um, it took me a long time to realise as a designer um, where you're wielding immense power. I mean, um, we have bulldozers at our disposal, which you know. It's quite remarkable that you can move such a serious amount of earth in such a short amount of time. That what we do is we often come to a place where, say, the soil carbon is at 1.8%, and we look at that and go, well, that's not that's not where we want to be. And then we look at it and say, well, what if through our practices, 
in 10 years we've increased that to say 4% soil carbon well how will the how will the landscape be then and it'll be considerably different and how if in 20 years time we're at 8% It'll be radically different. I mean, just the sheer volume of water that's held in in suspension in the soil uh, will be radically different. And so the landscape will be different accordingly because of the amount of water that's now held in it. And so that that sort of realisation made me me think, well, you know, sometimes what we do is we overshoot with our expenditure um, and in putting in um, capital that uh, that may not necessarily be appropriately spent. And so that's kind of a bit of a big handbrake as a designer. I mean, like I said, we have we often have um, money and fossil fuel-driven equipment at our disposal that allows us to do all of these things. But sometimes the best thing to do is just to work on those fundamentals such as soils and whatnot um, and just use a change of management and production such that uh, we can get these responses and then start to respond to the to the new normal as opposed to how it is now because often we're coming to sites and they're just they're just terrible um, it's really it's not unusual to find sites that are right on the edge of uh, desertification or right on the edge of atrophy um, or they've been atrophic for some time but they they've reached that point and so have the families managing them so that's why um, I think it's better to just take those little small steps and then work th- work on the bigger things if necessary later on. Okay. Yeah, that's really good because, you know, we've all seen these videos online of people going into like deserts and then just turning the desert into like this green oasis or um, like what you did in New Mexico, which we'll talk about a little bit later and, you know, mm-hmm. turning the, the bare dirt of New Mexico into... Uh, productive grassland, essentially. Um, yeah, there's a big difference between those projects. Um, you yeah. know, um, you know, in terms of the capital um, that's applied. I mean, I know the one in um, the one that you're talking about in the, in um, the Middle East. I mean, there's an extraordinary amount of capital applied to that and resources. And so, you know, by comparison to a bit of a scratch with a key line plow, it's um, yeah, it's a big big comparison. But we can talk about that later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, basically. The next principle that that uh, you have is number three is water, and mm-hmm. I mean this is a great segue into talking about water. So, um, and you said that we need to use water more effectively or efficiently before we can get into the green, before we can be green, you know, environmentally friendly, or before we can be black, which means making a profit. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Oh well, I actually. Um... Uh, the blue before green and black was yes, we need to focus on water and um, the water that we that we build into the landscape or hold, sequester, whatever you want to use in the landscape is um, paying respect to and consideration to the climate of the area, the biospheric climate, and um, and uh, putting it in places respective of the geography, the topography. So once we do that, um, then um, we can then, you know, a farmer who controls water starts to control their um, control their 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 outcomes. And uh, so, if we get blue water, then that means we can get green um, vegetation. But it also means we can get currency. We can get uh, money. Um, you know, <laughs> green is used as a, as a uh, as a term for money. So we need to get the money. Because I believe that you can't be green and in the red, as it were, yep. and that the residue of that is yes, um, profit, black, but it's also carbon um, that's stored in the system. Black is a is another colour that's used to reflect on carbon. So um, all of those things come within that term. But that, you know that that term is still true to me now. Yeah, that, that, that axiom. Yeah, that's a fantastic way to think about it. Um, that's really cool. Um, well, just these things help me and my small mind to sort of rationalize my way through things. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, when you do keep it simple, obviously it is much better and much easier for people to think about and reflect on. So that's great. Um, yeah. how, do, how do you approach water? Uh, you know, if there's someone out there listening to this interview mm-hmm. and they're, they're really understanding what you're saying, 
uh, and they want to start doing something, um, where do they start about water? What What's the foundational thought process or steps that they should be taking to decide upon, you know, maybe I should be grazing more livestock or changing my management, or, you know, maybe I need to get it to get to the point where I need to put swales in and start doing key line. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I mean, it comes back to the context of your enterprise and, and, uh, and you and, uh, and your, and your budgets and all of those sorts of things. But the, um, so that's the first thing always to look at. And that's why we've created this framework. Um, so you always come back to your, to your context. Um, then um, we look at the landscape, so we look at the geography and see what, what's possible. Um, but at the same time, you'll look at and say, well, what are the water needs of my system? And But coming back from that, um, in your assessment of your geography, um, you should be assessing how much water you actually have fall on your property each year, and a lot of people don't even know that. Um, so if you're in a... You know, if you're in an eight-inch rainfall area, well, that means you're getting a 44-gallon drum of water on every square yard that you have that you that you manage, and that's a not an inconsiderable amount of water, um, even though it's a relatively low, low uh, amount of rainfall. So, um, so that's the first thing is to look at how much you've got flowing through your site, so that you know your total catchment. Um, you also need to look at well, how many livestock am I running? How much water do they need to drink in a year? And so um, we'll work that figure out. So you'll just times the number of livestock, well, number of head of livestock, uh, times that by the days of the year that they're on your property, and that'll come out with a figure. Now, um, you might add 20 or 30% onto that figure just so that you can, you've got a bit of a buffer. And then the next thing is we'll do is we'll look at the site and go, okay, well, where's the potential storages on this site? And this is where the key line fabric comes or framework comes in and we'll look and say, all right, well, where's the highest possible place in the landscape that we can put some kind of uh, earthen storage potentially and where, if it fits in with the whole farm plan, um, if the highest catchment storage in a pond or dam or whatever you want to call it, um, is that the highest place that we can get reticulation via underground pipe network to troughs? Um, or do we need to put something up higher in the form of a tank or a system um, that we pump to from that storage so that we can get coverage of our whole landscape with a reticulation of water through that amazing stuff called polypipe? Um, and then give us the flexible grazing options that um, so many people would like to have these days uh, with uh, with planned grazing. If you're a, if if you're growing crops and whatnot, well then often um, what you're dealing with there is uh, rain fed systems, um, and so the best thing for you to do, as it is with pastoral systems as well, is to just focus on building soil carbon. Um, because every unit of soil carbon that you build is uh, eight units of water that you hold, um, and that's that's quite profound. Um, covering your soil, all of those sorts of things that we'll try and do, but also look at um, the the sources of water that you you've got currently and um, how feasible they are into the longer term. Um, particularly in the US, where a lot of people are dependent on underground water, which um, most people will, will, will realise is a, a very much declining resource, and so you need to start look. They need to start looking at the at the feasibility of that extraction over the longer period, and uh, maybe start to move to looking at um, storage of rainfall as an alternative. And uh, yeah, and that's where, like I said, that's where Keyline really comes in. And it may be that um, all you can do now. Or, or you can plan for in the future is to reduce your irrigated cropping area um, considerably and uh, develop more of a dry land approach. Um, and if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. You've got to work within your means. And uh, rainfall is a uh, <laughs> is something that um, you only get so much in a year, and uh, so understanding that uh, is is very important. Yeah, have you? Have you heard of anyone or have you helped of anyone uh, that has made that transition? Because I'm in Colorado and we do, mm -hmm. a we do a lot of irrigation and there's actually one place in Colorado called the San Luis Valley that is experiencing what you just described with 
using groundwater to irrigate crops and starting to realize uh, this water is going away. We're, we're losing it. So uh, do you know of anyone that has made that successful transition from irrigated crops to maybe a more dry land type situation? And, and how did they do it? Um, I personally, I'm just trying to think if I've worked with anybody who has gone through that transition and nothing um, comes to mind um, immediately. Um, it's something, I mean, I, I, uh, I've certainly worked uh, in Australia here. We don't use a lot of groundwater for irrigation. Some, in some districts certainly do, but um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the main stage, uh, most people don't. They use uh, rain uh, rainwater collection and uh, irrigate from there or or use it from rivers so it's not something i've had a lot of experience with i certainly um you know when i f- fly those three or four hours across the u.s and just see center pivots or se- a center center pivot dominated landscape I, I certainly think and look at how i might help people through a transition out of that system because it's pretty clear i mean you know lance lance endersby's book um, the voyage of discovery, where it talks a lot about um, about the uh, declining groundwater resources around the world, um, and you know how they ain't coming back. <laughs> yeah. Um, that uh, that um, you know we're go- we're going to have to really serious seriously ponder how we um, manage the transition for these uh, primary producers in these areas. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that the the main thing for them to do is to move because often they're in areas where they do get uh, adequate rainfall for a lower yield of dryland crops if they want to stay in cropping, or they're just going to have to move into pastoral based systems. Okay. Um, which yeah, that I, I can't see any other means. Um, I think that the other thing that will happen in areas like that in the transition is that uh, there'll be quite draconian laws around um, water use and extraction um, and access. And so accordingly, some of the things that we might do in Key Line where we harvest the rainfall that falls on a, on a property um, may actually be um, made unlawful. And so that will make things difficult if it isn't already. I know certainly in parts of the US um, I've seen uh, legislation that's, uh, that's really made it difficult for people to enact some of the um, things that we will do. And that's the whole premise of Keyline is that a farmer gets control of their own water and their own destiny. Um, but if you've got uh, laws that make that difficult, and most farmers are law-abiding people, um, then um, that makes it difficult. Yeah. But it's something we'll have to have to address. But, the, you know, the one thing I was just writing about this yesterday, the one thing that, um, that I don't know that they'll ever be able to, um, make a law about is that you increase soil carbon um, such that every drop of rainfall that you have fall on your property infiltrates into your soil and is held there and then that you develop a range of production systems around that that uh, sequesters that water and cycles that water in situ on site for as long as possible before it finally leaves yeah. and you know they're, they're some of the things that people really need to take a serious look at Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's kind of scary. The legislating, uh, making it illegal to use keyline plowing, but uh, essentially, can you just? Well, give it's not a- just keyline plowing; it's harvesting water into ponds and all of those sorts of things. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know um, in Colorado, there's actually someone that that sits on the computer and looks at updated satellite images of of properties for new pond mm. construction and if there's a new pond constructed then unfortunately yeah. they'll take action against that person yeah they're onto them yeah it's, yeah exactly it's crazy and it could, you know it's the most sensible thing to do within reason um is to have particularly if you know yeoman's back in the 1950s he was really excited about having um you know government extension officers you know that the, the equivalent of the nrcs type people who are quite broad in their approach to understanding a wide range of uh, agricultural enterprises and developments and et cetera. They sort of straddle that world between um, agricultural science and civil engineering. And uh, he was really excited to have those people understand Keyline really well so that they could give that level of self-determination to a farmer um, well into the future because, as I've said, um, if they control their own water, then they can control their own destiny. 
are now in an era of plastic pipe and, um, you know, thinking about soil carbon more and knowing so much more about that, about holistic management, plant grazing, um, et cetera. F farms don't necessarily need as much water as they used to. Um, we don't have to have the sort of profligate use that um, has underpinned so many of the developments that have, are taking us right up to today. So it's, and if that could be brought into the legislature, well, then um, they'd realise that um, it's actually something they should be encouraging within legislation, not um, discouraging. But, you know, that's a big piece to play. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we mentioned the New Mexico Key Line project, um, and it sounded, you alluded to the fact that it was pretty low cost. So I guess walk us through uh, that project, if you can. Um, well, a guy called Owen Hablitzel um, did a key line, did the first key line course that I ever delivered um, in the US in 2007 in just north of Santa Barbara at Aurelia Ranch. And um, yeah, he was a videographer <laughs> on, I think it was during the the, uh, the writer's strike. And so he had some time off and came and did the course here. Anyway, I, he sat down with me at the end of it and said, I really want to do something different. I don't want to keep working in this crazy industry. And I said, well, you know, what would be your advice? And I said, well, the first thing I'd do is go and do a holistic management course. So he went and so he did that with uh, Kirk Gadzier and, um, and and I said, find a client. And he, had, he said, oh, yeah, I've already found a client. So he found a client and uh, this guy, had, first thing he did was went and bought a key line plow and a really big tractor. And I thought, oh, and he sent me photos and I went, wow, that's not the usual thing that people do. <laughs> but anyway... Um, <laughs> because he bought this big um, rubber tracked cat challenger and uh, I don't know, I think it was about an 11 time yeoman's plow and uh, I thought, wow. And then um, he wanted to get my advice on how to use it and set it up and stuff. So um, um, I managed, I went down there and had a talk with him about that and uh, we made some, we made some sort of uh, decisions about how the plow would be trafficked across that landscape. And so they did that and, um, you know, and sent me some photos a bit later on and um, showed me the outcome of breaking the soil surface on a site that had really not had any vegetation grow on uh, for about 50 or 60 years. Um, I think it had irrigated cotton on it and it still had all of the irrigation infrastructure there, but the whole area was abandoned. It was sort of like an irrigation, a post-irrigation desert. Um, yeah, but uh, we, we just basically use the key line plough and I'm, I'm, um, to break the uh, the surface crust really um, and break some of the um, the compaction that was underneath that. I think we only ploughed about eight inches deep, so not that deep. But it just you know it, it, the desert just bloomed for a moment, and um, I'm convinced that we could have got a similar effect if we just had have used um, high density grazing and animal impact to break that surface crust. But um, that wouldn't have done the work on the subsoil. Um, that takes a lot longer. But, uh, yeah, that was what we did. Unfortunately, the client, an interesting guy, I quite like him, but um, he he didn't follow it up with um, with grazing. I mean, that would have been fantastic because it, we would have started to have got the energy flow of from sunlight into a polysaccharide transfer into the soil, which would have awakened all of the soil biota, and then that would have supported the transition to it being coming a uh, perennial grassland again. We didn't get there, and I don't know what's happened with it now, but it was a very exciting moment to see that, you know, doing such a, using such a small amount of energy um, could result in such a profound outcome yeah. in such a short time, and a lot of people were pretty excited about it. Hey, it's Chris Delzer from Agricultural Insights, and I wanted to let you know about a very special membership program that we have over at Agricultural Insights. It's called the Agricultural Insights Premium Membership. And inside that membership, you get four interviews done with the world's most innovative farmers and ranchers sent to your email every single month. But that's not all. Best of all, I'm going to be including three bonuses with your Agricultural Insights Premium Membership. The first bonus is my Mob Grazing eBook. Well, you'll learn all there is to know about mob grazing and increasing your forage growth, profits, and production from your grazing management with this book. The second bonus I'm going to be including is my sneak peek inside my Grazing Mastery Program. 
And as you already know, the Grazing Mastery program, in my opinion, is the world's best online grazing management training. So you're gonna get a sneak peek into that for free. And finally, bonus number three is my famous number crunching spreadsheet. So this will show you how to plan for profit first before you do anything else in your business. And you'll also have access to this spreadsheet 24 seven, 365 days a year. And you can, even save, you can even save it to your computer. And all of these bonuses are $500 or more in value. Uh, and that's not all. The best thing about signing up for the Agricultural Insights Premium Membership today is I'm giving you a seven day trial for only $1. That's right, I'm so confident that you're gonna love the Agricultural Insights Premium Membership that I want you to sign up and just put down $1. If you don't like it, you can cancel within that seven day period and there's no hard feelings. But I know you're gonna love the world-class interviews that we send you every single month with the Agricultural Insights Premium Membership Program. And to this date, we've done over 150 of those interviews. So you're gonna get access to four of those interviews every single month, plus the bonuses I just mentioned and even some special bonus trainings once you get inside of our membership program. So do the right thing. Sign up for the Agricultural Insights Premium Membership Program today by clicking on the link in the email that I just sent you or going to the link that you see on your screen. That's all for me, and I hope to see you on the other side of our Premium Membership Program. Take care. Bye.